small reefs of Puget Sound. Individual acorn barnacles, acting independently of one another, combine to mimic the reef-building properties of coral. Barnacles are well-integrated members of intertidal communities. But more than that, they enrich an ecosystem populated by diverse and wonderful plants and animals. In this video session, we illustrate the habitat building behavior of a single barnacle species. First, we briefly introduce some different types of barnacles for the purpose of differentiating our primary subject from thousands of other species. Then an overview of the dynamic rich habitat associated with barnacles. It is important we tell you of the size, shape, development, and behavior of our favorite barnacle species, so we will do this as the third step. And then we'll share what we have learned about barnacle clustering, and even show you some animations illustrating the life cycle of clusters. Finally, near the end, we inventory some wonderful critters and creatures that benefit from a home among the barnacle clusters. There are two distinctly different groups, superorder thoracica, of barnacles. The gooseneck type anchors itself to something solid, while the armored portion, capitulum, is at the other end of a flexible stalk. The fully anchored acorn type has the entire adult animal permanently affixed to a solid substrate. Of the two common conspicuous species of acorn barnacles in Puget Sound, Balanus glandula is very small, amazingly tolerant of extreme conditions, and extremely numerous. The other, Semibalanus cariosus, is the focus of our investigation. It is much larger and differs in other important ways. Cariosis individuals are substantial. The soft parts within the shell are about the same size and weight as a field mouse, about a half to a full ounce. As beach walkers, we seldom see them actively feeding but they are easily located due to their large size and unique joining pattern between opercular plates. Here are several hundred of various ages in dense aggregation. But the impact of cariosis in many intertidal zone biocommunities is exponentially greater than their numbers. In this report, we intend to demonstrate how inherent characteristics of individual cariosis combine to create habitat. Habitat to help support a variety of other intertidal zone animals and plants. Barnacles are not colonial animals, but individuals of the species Cariosis in aggregate can mimic the reef building capacity of colonial coral. The structure of a specific type of barnacle aggregation, like that of branching coral, creates additional surface area. Complex topography and long-lived accumulations of calcium carbonate. The similarities between branching coral and cariosis aggregations are limited, but their role within an ecosystem, that of habitat builder, is comparable. As we explore the mechanics of barnacle reef building, we'll highlight the similarities and differences. Most importantly, we hope to share with you our growing appreciation for cariosis. Barnacles are notorious for interfering with the normal activities of other intertidal animals, sometimes to the exclusion of other types. 
But we've observed a direct positive correlation between the abundance of barnacles and the overall diversity, the complexity of specific local ecosystems. How do large aggregations of barnacles actually contribute to the richness of intertidal habitats? Within the range of our favorite barnacle, from the uppermost tide line to the lowest, cariosis have varying degrees of success. At the uppermost tide zone, they are infrequent and small. At their lower range, they are relatively few in numbers, but grow old and large. But for cariosis in the middle tidal zone, conditions are just right for settlement and growth. A nice balance of submersion, feeding and breeding time, and predator limiting exposure. It is in this optimal environment, cariosis show themselves to have a wide range of responses to external conditions, a variability that enables clustering. More about clustering later. Barnacles broadcast their larvae into the surrounding sea. After many days and seven larval transformations, the last larval stage, a cyprid, has drifted far from its place of origin. It must attach itself to a surface where it will spend its entire adult life. They can attach to many substrates. Importantly, the external surface of existing cariosis is among those places where attachment will succeed and adult growth begin. Grow they must but it is an awkward imbalance between having a rigid protective shell and their heritage, crustacean lineage, of growth through molting. The shells become bigger through the addition of material to their calcified plates. This causes each wall plate to become taller through deposition at the bottom and wider, thicker, through the addition of material inside and at the margin. The opening through which the barnacle conducts its life, the operculum, must also grow. The opercular plates get larger as calcium carbonate is added to the interior and margins. The aperture must become larger. Geometric constraints require the operculum's position to move lower relative to its previous attachment plane. Meanwhile, the soft body tissue within the shell must periodically grow by molting. The exteriors of the wall plates are not modified during a growth cycle. One last important detail. Cariosis, unlike other species, make no calcareous base. New arrivals, having attached to the exterior of others, are able to grow across plate boundaries even as the barnacle to which they are attached continues to grow. Distorted yet functional shapes often occur. The final larval stage, cyprid, of cariosis have an inherent preference for places to begin their adult life. The outside of earlier generations' wall plates is among those places attractive to them. It is very difficult to imagine what benefit this behavior might have to the barnacles to which they attach. We've named this behavior, that of growing one upon another, clustering, and the resultant structure a cluster. Clusters add members, and as each constituent member grows, a dynamic branching structure is formed. Subsequent settlers move upward relative to the base of those they attach to. Subsequent settlers tend to elongate. Overall, the cluster grows in three dimensions. For our purposes, it is sufficient to model the arrival of new cariosis as a series of random events. A cluster is the unit of reef building. Smothering, predation, and age allow the death of individuals and, of course, the onset of connective tissue deterioration. 
somewhere, anywhere between the cluster base, oldest individual, and smother killed subsequent settlers, structural continuity breaks down. Winter storm waves dislodge clusters. Tossed about on the beach or smothered in sand, none of the individuals will survive. Fresh substrate becomes available. And the cluster building cycle starts again. Okay, and now a quick summary. Karyosis differs from other acorn barnacles in minor ways. However, these small differences in very specific environmental conditions enable a one upon another aggregation. The resultant structure, a cluster, is an emergent property of the species. Dense concentrations of fellow intertidal animals exist coincident with clusters. We'll wrap this up with a visual inventory of cluster-based habitat. Green shore crabs are sometimes difficult to see. Tunicate skeletons are a little bigger than rice grains. Brightly colored bryozoans are sometimes seen. During the process of preparing our cluster specimens, these small crabs made their escape. An anemone hunkers down between karyosis when the tide is out. Here's another nice hermit. Feather duster worms retreat far into their flexible housing. And this group of gastropods hide out. Sponges have nowhere to go. Another shore crab hides among the barnacles. Chitin are sometimes seen despite their camouflage. Thanks for watching.